Hey, Mr. Z. Hey, Ms. Watt, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. Ready to get started? What are we talking about today? Uh, we're going to talk about rates of weathering. So we've already talked about mechanical weathering, and we've talked about chemical weathering, and now we're going to talk about what affects the rates of weathering. Okay, so we have one learning target, and that is I can identify and describe factors that affect weathering rates. Yeah. All right, good. It's being stubborn. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this uh, this diagram here real quick, and it's pretty clear to see that we have one solid mass, and that's illustrated in uh, picture one, and then we can see that it's kind of breaking apart into smaller pieces. Okay, so I'm looking at picture one, and if I think about each side on that cube yeah. being one centimeter in length, right, and there are six sides. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have six centimeters squared. Six square centimeters of, of surface area, right? Exactly. Okay, and surface area is important because the chemical weathering really can only happen on the surface. It exactly. can't happen from the inside out. No. It happens at the surface. And if we think back to mechanical weathering, actually breaking the material apart or rocks apart, right, into smaller pieces, we're actually going to increase the surface area. Yep. So if we take a look at image number two, we can see that we've now broken up this one piece into eight different pieces. Mm -hmm. And now we actually have more of the surface exposed for chemical weathering to act on. Okay, so if we were to count up the numbers of faces, you can either do it as a centimeter on a side or a quarter of a centimeter for the smaller mm -hmm. blocks, right? Yeah. What you'll find out is that you've doubled the amount of surface area. Exactly. So we went from six square centimeters in the first diagram where it's just the cube to now so 12, 12 square centimeters. So that's going to have a big impact on the amount of chemical weathering that's going to occur. Exactly. It's going to happen that much faster because there's that much more uh -huh. surface area. And, and then what's the third one? Yeah, and then for the third one, we now break it down again, right? So more mechanical weathering, breaking it down into smaller pieces, exposing more of the surface of the rock itself where chemical weathering can again act uh, on it. And if we take a look at the math on this one, we now have 27 cubes. Uh, all with six sides, and those would be a third of a centimeter times a third of a centimeter. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the math can get kind of complicated there, but we have a lot more surface area as we continue to get smaller and smaller. So if you want to challenge yourself, go ahead and figure out the surface area for diagram three and uh, come to class and see if we're happy about that yeah. enough to... Um, <laughs> Maybe find some Snickers bars or something yeah. left over. <laughs> or more M&M's. Oh, no, more There's m &Ms. Any There you go. <laughs> okay, so talking about how mechanical weathering assists chemical weathering. Yeah, and we kind of talked about this in the last uh, in the last slide there. So the more surface area that we have, mm -hmm. uh, the more that chemical weathering can act to break down that material. Okay, so in the picture here, we're seeing some sort of little cliff and. Mm -hmm. Falling rocks falling down from the cliff. Maybe they broke off because of frost wedging. Sure. Right? Or maybe exfoliation occurred, although it doesn't look like in this picture. Yeah. And they piled up at the bottom into a talus slope. Uh huh. And now that there's more surface area exposed, the chemical weathering is going to proceed faster mm -hmm. on those smaller pieces that were broken up mechanically. Exactly. Okay, good. All I right. love graphs. Yeah, I do too. All right, let's see what this, this one's telling one. us. Yeah. All right, so if we take a look at the graph itself, uh, we've got a bunch of different colors there, and we'll take a look at our axes there. On the y-axis, we have temperature, and then on the x-axis, we have precipitation, right? And certain types of weathering uh, happen in certain climates, right? So if we think about what frost wedging requires, mm -hmm. if we're thinking about mechanical weathering, we need... We need some kind of water source, right. right? And we need a fluctuation in temperature. Right. So if in a climate we never see the temperature go below freezing, then we really can't expect there to be a whole lot of frost wedging. Right. Right. So uh, we're going to take a closer look at this diagram and take a look at some different uh, areas and see what types of weathering are actually going on there. Okay, so I think one thing that's really interesting to notice, first of all, is if you look at the y-axis, look at the values there, mm -hmm. zero degrees C. So freezing temperature yep. of water uh -huh. is kind of in the middle of the yeah. y-axis. It's not at the top or the bottom. So sure. above that, it's warmer than the freezing temperature of water. Yep. And below that, it's colder than the freezing temperature yep. of water. Yep. So we would expect to see frost wedging below the zero mm -hmm. level of, of the temperature, right? Exactly. That's where you're going to have freezing. And 
strong physical weathering happening where it's even colder, yeah. but there has to be water. Yeah, right? exactly. Okay, and that's what we see. The darker blue color at the bottom of this diagram mm -hmm. is the stronger physical weathering component. Exactly. And if we go lower, we see where the strong physical weathering is, and I can move my mouse there so you can actually see it. But then notice if I decrease the amount of rainfall, then I decrease the amount of physical weathering taking place, mm -hmm. because if there is no water source, then we can't really have physical weathering. Okay. All right. And now if we take a look for chemical weathering, as we mentioned, or as you mentioned in the last video, water is a pretty critical element to mm -hmm. most chemical weathering, mm -hmm. right? And also, if we take a look at the temperature, right? So strong chemical weathering requires a very high mean temperature mm -hmm. and also a lot of moisture. Right, so if we think about maybe a tropical climate with a lot of humidity, any type of heat source is always going to drive chemical reactions mm -hmm. in nature. Right. right, the colder it is, then we don't really seem to see a lot of chemical reactions or as many. So we're going to see more, or more rapid rates of hydrolysis, oxidation, mm -hmm. dissolution exactly. in those warmer and wetter exactly. areas. And we're going to see higher rates of frost wedging and exfoliation in the areas where there's still water, but it's much colder. Yeah, and okay. if we take a look over here, maybe in this area, this is where we would expect to find like a desert type region, and there really isn't as much weathering going on there at all, because we have an absence of water, right? So chemically, we're not gonna have a whole lot. Right. We don't really get below freezing, well we do, but uh, there's no water there to freeze anyway, so there's not a whole lot of weathering going on, except maybe for thermal expansion. Right, good. Okay, so I think that's our last slide here, I right? Think it so is, yeah. jump out to your class webpage and take your quiz, and we'll see you in class tomorrow. All right, take care. Bye, guys. Bye.